Hi, I'm Matt Payne, and welcome to 20th Century Revolutions. Episode 1.16, The Great Eastern Crisis. When the Bulgarian Revolutionary Central Committee launched their uprising in April of 1876, none of the rebels could have predicted the sheer magnitude of the public outcry witnessed throughout Europe in support of the cause of Bulgarian liberation. If they had lived to see the summer of 1876, the heroes and martyrs of the Bulgarian struggle, people like George Yurkovsky, Vasilevsky, and Hristobotev, would not have even dared to dream that they might be able to spark such widespread public support for the Bulgarians throughout Great Britain, France, Russia, and even the United States. But as the horrific details of the massacres of Bulgarian civilians at the hands of the Bashi Bazouk began to filter into the Western presses, there emerged a perfect storm of public opinion that was as radically pro-Bulgarian as it was anti-Ottoman. And as we will see today, just as had happened during the Greek Revolution some 50 years earlier, this turn in Western public opinion will be what ultimately secures the liberation of not only the Bulgarians who will win autonomy and de facto independence, but also the Serbs, the Romanians, and the Montenegrins who will finally win full-on internationally recognized de jure independence. So, over the next two episodes, we are going to trace the events of the Great Eastern Crisis, which will lead to the emergence of the independent modern nation-states of the Balkans, and which will fundamentally change the nature of the Ottoman Empire. So, as we talked about last week, news of the Bulgarian atrocities set off a firestorm in the European press, especially in Great Britain and Russia. In Great Britain, the liberal politician William Gladstone used the Bulgarian horrors, as he called them, to criticize his political rival, conservative Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli, and to condemn his government's continued support of the Ottoman Empire. In Russia, the Pan-Slav movement began to gain major momentum as figures such as Russian ambassador to Constantinople, Count Ignatiev, and author Fyodor Dostoevsky began to bang the war drums as they called for intervention in support of their fellow Slavs, namely the Bulgarians and the Serbs, who were currently the victims of widespread repression at the hands of the Ottomans, who sought to crush the Serbian Herzegovina uprising and the Bulgarian April uprising. This turn in public opinion in Britain and Russia would create a dangerous international situation for the Ottomans, as they became more and more diplomatically isolated on the world stage. Because you may remember from episode 1.11, The Eastern Question, and it wouldn't be a terrible idea to re-listen to that episode on like 1.5 speed or something, as a lot of what we are about to discuss is coming directly out of that episode. But the Ottomans had since the Crimean War become increasingly dependent on France and most especially Great Britain for both diplomatic and financial support. For decades now, supporting the territorial integrity of the Ottoman Empire had been a centerpiece of British foreign policy because maintaining the Ottoman Empire meant halting the southern expansion of the Russians into Eastern Europe and Western Asia. Well, news of the Bulgarian atrocities turned British public opinion so radically against the Ottomans that anti-Ottoman feeling began to drown out anti-Russian paranoia within the British press. And though this would not bring the British to go as far as declaring war on the Ottomans, what it would do is so severely weaken diplomatic ties between London and Constantinople that the Ottomans would be left without their strongest ally. And this isolation couldn't have come at a worse time, as Russia was experiencing increasing war fever with more and more public officials and prominent intellectuals beginning to adopt a pan-Slavist point of view, which saw Russia as the protector of Slavic Christians still living under Ottoman tyranny. Though, as we saw at the end of last episode, the Tsar still needed to move very carefully because he was at least officially committed to the status quo in the Balkans as Russia was a member of Otto von Bismarck's League of the Three Emperors, which had divided hegemony over the Balkans between Russia and Austria-Hungary. Any move by Russia into the Balkans would be seen by the Austrians as a breach of this agreement because the Austrians strongly opposed Pan-Slavism due to the fact that they themselves 
ruled over a large Slavic population. And Austria did not want the Slavs of their empire to start breaking away, because this would further fracture their already fracturing empire. So, in the summer of 1876, as the uprisings in Bulgaria and Bosnia-Herzegovina were being ruthlessly crushed, the Russians began to make several moves in preparation for their long-awaited war against the Ottomans. And broadly speaking, before launching this war, the Russians wanted to avoid at all costs a repeat of the Crimean War, which had seen the Russians become diplomatically isolated. We already mentioned one of these diplomatic moves last week when we discussed the Reichstadt Agreement in which the Russian Tsar Alexander and the Austrian Emperor Franz Josef made an informal agreement on what their future Balkan policy would be should a war break out between the Russians and the Ottomans. In this agreement, it was decided that Austria would be allowed to annex Bosnia-Herzegovina from the Ottomans in exchange for Russia annexing further Ottoman territory around the Black Sea. And then the other stipulation was that they agreed to not allow the creation of a large Slavic state in the Balkans, whether that be an enlarged Russia or a new big Serbia or big Bulgaria. This provision will end up being super duper important because this policy was in direct contradiction to the desires of the Russian pan Slavs like Count Ignatiev, who very much wanted to create a large Slavic state in the Balkans and in fact had been working towards that very goal for years because such a Slavic state was to be placed under the influence of Russia as their powerful Slavic benefactor. So, as we will see, there is going to emerge a separation between Russia's official policy towards the Balkans, which was being broadcasted by Tsar Alexander, and Russia's actual on-the-ground policy in the Balkans, which was increasingly being driven by the Russian ambassador Count Ignatiev and his fellow Slavophiles. This dynamic in which Ignatiev and the Pan-Slavs were kind of improvising their own foreign policy will come to be especially important in the eventual treaty negotiations following this impending Russian-Ottoman war in the spring of 1878. But for the time being, in the lead-up to this war in the summer of 1876, it was actually most important in Serbia, because the Pan-Slavs were beginning to send signals to the Serbs that now might be a good time to launch a war against the Ottomans. And you may remember from our episode on the April Uprising that Bulgarian rebels like Ristobotev and Stefan Stambolov had strongly believed that a war was bound to break out between Serbia and the Ottomans sometime in late 1875 or at the latest early 1876. And this war was meant to give the Bulgarians cover for their own uprising in the spring of 1876. Well, this war did not end up materializing, mainly due to the hesitancy of the Serbian prince Milan. But the reason that the Bulgarians thought that it would break out was because of the ongoing uprising in Bosnia-Herzegovina, which had been launched by Serbian rebels. And these Serbian rebels had basically gotten all of their weapons through informal connections with the Serbian government over in Belgrade. And so, we're seeing a similar dynamic to what we just saw with Russia and the Pan-Slavs. Because in Serbia, the official head of state, Prince Milan, had long been opposed to this war because he rightly predicted that the Serbian military was ill-prepared and was bound to lose a war with the Ottomans. But there were increasingly powerful elements within Serbia who were driving foreign policy towards a program of aggressive Serbian expansionism. Really, ever since the Serbian Revolution, way back in the first two decades of the 1800s, there had emerged a new sense of radical pan-Serb nationalism, sort of akin to the pan-Slavism of Count Ignatiev, except the pan-Serb agenda conceived of Serbia as the big, powerful Slavic nation that would unite the Slavs of the Balkans. So, even though war was strongly opposed by the Serbian Prince Milan, the growing popularity of pan-Serbism would begin to drive Serbia towards war with the Ottomans in the summer of 1876. And a central aspect of pan-Serbism was this thing called Greater Serbia, or Old Serbia, which essentially looked to the medieval kingdom of Serbia that had existed way back even before the initial Ottoman conquest. Because you may remember that Serbia was originally taken by Mehmed the Conqueror in the 1400s, so yeah, 
This was quite a long time ago. And honestly, trying to draw a straight line from the Serbian kingdom of the 1300s to the modern Serbian nation-state of the late 1800s was a bit of a stretch. But nonetheless, this connection with medieval Serbia was integral to pan-Serbism, and it's going to continue to play a very important role, not only in Serbia, but in world history. Because the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, the precipitating event of World War I, will come out of this greater Serbia ideology, as the assassins were acting as members of the revolutionary society Unification or Death, aka the Black Hand. And what Unification or Death meant was the unification of all South Slavic peoples under the Serbian leadership in Belgrade. So yeah, the Pan-Serbs are going to continue to radicalize quite a bit in the coming decades, leading up to World War I. But in the 1870s, the idea of Greater Serbia was already becoming wildly popular, so that when the pro-Serbian uprising broke out in neighboring Bosnia-Herzegovina, there was widespread public outcry urging the government to declare war on the Ottomans to support their fellow Serbs in Bosnia-Herzegovina. And the ultimate goal of pan-Serbs was to use this war to pry the territory of Bosnia-Herzegovina away from the Ottomans. This annexation of Bosnia-Herzegovina into Serbia was seen as an important first step towards achieving Greater Serbia, because most formulations of Greater Serbia included Bosnia-Herzegovina. Well, you should now be asking, wait a minute, I thought that Russia and Austria-Hungary were about to agree that Austria would be allowed to annex Bosnia-Herzegovina. And indeed they are, in like two weeks from now. And for shadow alert, this is going to create a lot of lingering tension between Austria-Hungary and Serbia. And it is no coincidence that World War I would erupt when an Austrian Archduke, Franz Ferdinand, was assassinated by a radical pan-Serb, Gavrilo Princip, in the regional capital of Bosnia-Herzegovina, Sarajevo. And so now I hope you are beginning to see the quite specific ways that Ottoman collapse in the Balkans is laying the groundwork for World War I. But anyways, in the summer of 1876, war fever was hot in Serbia, and Prince Milan was beginning to fear that there might be a coup or even a popular revolution to overthrow him if he continued to push back against war with the Ottomans. Then the real tipping point came when the pan-Slav Russian diplomats began to send informal signals to Prince Milan that Russia would likely support a Serbian war with the Ottomans. So, with this alleged promise of Russian support in hand, and while facing possible revolution at home, Prince Milan finally declared war on the Ottomans. And to give you an idea of just how much the popular mythology of Greater Serbia is now driving events in Belgrade, war plans were drawn up on the anniversary of the Battle of Kosovo, which we talked about way back in episode 1.1 of this series, because this was the battle when the Ottomans first defeated the Serbs in 1389. And during this battle from the dark and misty past, the Serbian martyr Miloš Obalić allegedly assassinated Sultan Murad I. And for our modern-day Serbs, the Battle of Kosovo had quickly become a centerpiece of pan-Serb nationalism. So, the Serbs began finalizing their war plans on June 28th, St. Vitus Day, the anniversary of the Battle of Kosovo. And now you can see how these Serbs conceived of this war as like medieval revenge or something. You know, finally settling the score after 500 years. And not to just keep hammering you over the head with this point, but I am now going to hammer you over the head with this point. Guess when Franz Ferdinand was assassinated? That's right, June 28th, a day specifically picked out for its symbolic importance as Gavrilo Princip and his co-conspirators whose actions would launch the world into World War I thought of themselves as the spiritual descendants of the Serbian martyr and assassin Miloš Obalić, who had allegedly killed Sultan Murad at the Battle of Kosovo. So yeah, a lot of threads are beginning to come together. But to return to the narrative. The summer of 1876 had not been great for the Ottomans. We've got ongoing uprisings in the Balkans, public outrage across Europe, Russia drawing up war plans, and now Serbia declaring war. And it is worth taking a second to remember that we are still only like two months out from the April uprising. And I'll say it again, even though the vast majority of the Bulgarian rebels who launched the April uprising were now, well, dead, 
nearly all of their goals are becoming a reality as their long-hoped-for Serbian declaration of war had now finally come about, and Russia was clearly moving closer and closer to war as well. And all of these developments kind of came about as a result of the April Uprising. I mean, there are a lot of other factors at play here, but the April Uprising and the subsequent Bulgarian atrocities had been the event that shifted European public opinion, and this shift in public opinion is what gave the Russians, and therefore the Serbs as well, the diplomatic leeway they needed to move towards war with the Ottomans. But now, let's talk about the poor old Ottomans. What's been happening over at the Splime Port while all of this craziness was going on? Well, let me tell you, quite a lot has been happening. And if you can believe it, the recent shift in European public opinion and the recent war with the Serbs were not even like the main concerns of the Ottoman imperial government at this time. Because throughout 1875 and 1876, while all of the uprisings in Bosnia-Herzegovina and Bulgaria were being launched, the Sublime Port had been facing a major political and financial crisis. Remember how we talked about how the Ottomans had become increasingly indebted to British and French financiers ever since taking out loans to fund the Crimean War? And remember how we said that this debt would balloon to absurd proportions? Well, here we are. This debt has now ballooned to absurd proportions, and the financial situation for the Ottomans has only gotten a kajillion times worse over the 20 years following the Crimean War, due to reckless spending on completely unnecessary things like shiny new palaces and expanding the navy and ridiculously high salaries for public officials. Well, all of this profligate spending meant that by 1875, the Ottoman national debt was completely unmanageable, and it was estimated that the Ottomans owed somewhere close to 220 million British pounds, which, all right, but the estimated yearly revenues of the Sublime Port were around 20 million British pounds. So their debt is now 10 times that of their yearly revenue. So this left almost no room to pay for basic day-to-day -day operations, because while the Ottomans were busy not paying off their debts, the interest on those debts was skyrocketing. And in the early 1870s, as global economic panics were heightening the financial crisis even further, the Ottomans did not respond by, you know, cutting back on their extravagant expenses, but instead decided to reinstate widespread tax farming. As part of the Tanzimat reforms, the tax farming system had at least been nominally done away with. But then, in the face of financial ruin in the early 1870s, the Ottomans decided that they had no choice but to reintroduce exploitative tax farming. And this reintroduction of tax farming was actually a big reason why rebels in Bosnia-Herzegovina and Bulgaria were able to find so many sympathetic recruits for their uprisings in 1875 and 1876. This financial mismanagement finally came to a head in late 1875 when the Ottomans officially defaulted on their public debt and just stopped paying interest on their massive loans. As you might expect, this greatly angered the French and the British, who were the primary financiers of the Ottomans. And when this default was coupled with news of the Bulgarian atrocities six months later, well, as we've said, the British and the French are cooling quite a bit on the Ottomans. The public debt crisis will eventually lead to the creation of the Ottoman Public Debt Administration in 1881, and this administration will eventually employ close to 10,000 people, more people than the actual Ottoman Finance Ministry. So, the Ottoman Public Debt Administration will basically come to run the finances of the empire, and importantly, this administration will be controlled by Western Europeans. So, European control of Ottoman finances will only become even more pronounced at the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century. But in May of 1876, as this debt crisis was ongoing, and as uprisings were becoming more and more widespread in the Balkans, the Ottomans then faced, wait for it, a coup! Yippee! And knowing what's been happening over the past several months, you can probably imagine why there might be a coup. But to put it simply, the current Sultan Abdul Aziz was closely associated with the extravagant spending that had led to the debt crisis. 
And the reason he was closely associated with the debt crisis was because he had been the one who had built that fancy palace and expanded the Navy instead of paying off his interest. So, in the spring of 1876, widespread anti-European demonstrations erupted in Constantinople. In reaction to the debt default and in reaction to increasing influence of Westerners at the supply and port as a result of this default. As these demonstrations continued to grow in size, a group associated with the young Ottomans began to put together plans for a coup under the leadership of our old friend Bidhat Pasha, former Tanzimat governor of Bulgaria and future promulgator of the constitution. So, Midhat and his young Ottoman comrades began to recruit students from the military academy. Then, they went over to the Constantinople military barracks and managed to round up a handful of officers. And this military force then surrounded Sultan Abdul Aziz, who was now trapped in his fancy new palace that he had built using his European loans. And Sultan Abdul Aziz would be deposed in May of 1876 and replaced by his nephew, Murad V. But unfortunately for Murad and for the Ottoman Empire, the new sultan suffered from many mental health issues, which, man, I can't see why a young fella such as Murad would have mental health issues having grown up as a prince in an empire constantly in a state of crisis. But poor Murad did have mental health issues, and they would quickly get the best of him when the shocking news came that his uncle, the recently deposed Abdul Aziz, had been found dead. Less than a week after being overthrown and while under house arrest, Abdul Aziz had asked his captors for a pair of scissors to cut his beard, but he instead used these scissors to slit his wrists and he was found dead on June the 5th. Of course, there are tons of conspiracy theories that claim Abdul Aziz was murdered, but it is somewhat widely accepted that he died by suicide. The suicide of his uncle sent the already emotionally fragile Murad into a bit of a tailspin, and he became distant, erratic, and uninterested in his new role as sultan, clearly preferring his old life of quiet aristocratic luxury in which he could freely pursue his passions for music and poetry. And Murad had actually been an accomplished composer, and he was quite proficient at piano, violin, and lute. And in the months after his uncle's death, Murad would retreat into his music and his alcoholism. And it was quickly becoming clear to Midhat Pasha and the other young Ottoman conspirators who had put Murad into power that they maybe had chosen the wrong man for the job. So in late August, just two months after being declared sultan, Murad would himself fall victim to yet another coup organized by the very same forces that had just brought him to power. And Murad's younger half-brother, Abdul Hamid, was declared sultan on August 31st, 1876. Now, we are going to talk a whole lot more about Abdul Hamid because he's going to stick around for over 30 years, and he will emerge as the main villain against which the Young Turks are going to launch their revolution in 1908. But for the time being, it seemed that the coup of Midhat Pasha and the young Ottomans might actually pay off because, much like his older half-brother Murad, Abdul Hamid had come to be associated with the young Ottomans and their western-facing approach. Abdul Hamid had traveled throughout Europe as a young man and had impressed European dignitaries and heads of state, so his ascension to the Ottoman throne was seen as a positive development amongst Europeans. And it was generally believed that Abdul Hamid would bring about much-needed liberalizing reforms and that his ascendancy would be a welcomed change within the crisis atmosphere in the summer of 1876. And while the ultimate legacy of Abdul Hamid will be mixed— For the time being, he was, for the most part, being driven by the young Ottomans and their leader, Midhat Pasha. And in exchange for helping to put him on the throne, Abdul Hamid had been forced by the young Ottomans to promise that he would promulgate a constitution. So this brings us to the fall of 1876. The Ottomans are completely broke, facing multiple insurrections and now fully isolated diplomatically. But they did have a new sultan, and a new constitution was on its way. And this at least brought a glimmer of hope in the midst of all this chaos. And then some more much-needed good news actually came when the war with Serbia began to turn decisively in favor of the Ottomans. As the Serbian Prince Milan had predicted, the Serbs were way outmatched in facing off against the Ottomans. The radical pan-Serbs in Belgrade had long romanticized the power of their popular peasant army, which they 
somewhat irrationally thought would just magically sweep through Ottoman Europe, liberating all of the South Slavs without needing, I don't know, any training or any discipline or really any organization whatsoever. Well, things didn't really work out like that at all, and the Ottomans, who had spent the last 50 years aggressively modernizing their army, had better discipline, more experienced officers, and more up-to-date weapons, which was a big deal as weapons technology was quickly advancing at this point. So the Serbs had mostly single-shot rifles that you had to constantly reload, while the Ottomans had cartridge rifles that could be fired in quick succession. And then they also had superior artillery and Western European officers who actually knew how to use this artillery. So the Serbs began to suffer heavy losses, and in September and October of 1876, the first two months of Abdul Hamid's reign, the Ottomans were scoring one victory after another against the Serbs. And now you should be asking, hey, wait a minute, I thought that the Russians had promised that they would help the Serbs. Well, yes, Russian diplomats had sent informal agreements to Prince Milan that Russia would back them up. But as we will see, these Serbian losses will begin to make the Russians question whether or not the Serbs were in fact the right Slavs to back. And they were beginning to think that maybe they should go with the Bulgarians instead. And this shift in Russian preference from the Serbs to the Bulgarians will take some time, but it is going to be important. But the Russians weren't quite ready to just leave the Serbs completely out to dry. So even though they did not yet declare war on the Ottomans in support of the Serbs, the Tsar did put forth an ultimatum to the Supply Port demanding an armistice. The Ottomans knew that they were isolated at this point, having lost the support of both the British and the French, so they had no choice but to accept this ceasefire. And on November 1st, 1876, an armistice was declared between the Serbs and the Ottomans. And it was during this armistice, in the winter of 1876, that the diplomatic scheming that would come to define the legacy of the Great Eastern Crisis really began to heat up. Because the great powers decided to hold a conference in Constantinople in order to discuss the ongoing Ottoman crisis. And foreshadowing what is to come, this conference included Great Britain, France, Russia, Austria-Hungary, Germany, and Italy. But guess who was not invited to this conference specifically held to discuss the future of the Ottoman Empire? That's right. The Ottomans themselves would not get the invite to sit at the cool kids' lunch table, even though those cool kids were eating lunch in Constantinople. So, in December of 1876, the great powers met to decide what should be done about the Ottoman Empire, and specifically, they planned to discuss what was going to be done about the Balkans and what the future of Ottoman Europe might look like. Well, as you might expect, the Ottomans were not too pleased about this situation. But since all the great powers were now on board with this Constantinople conference, there was not a whole lot they could do about it for the time being. So instead of trying to prevent the Congress from meeting, the Ottomans decided to preempt the verdict of the great powers. Midhat Pasha, who had recently been appointed Grand Vizier, and the new Sultan Abdul Hamid, both knew quite well that the primary focus of the great powers at the Constantinople Conference would be to discuss what reforms they would force upon the Ottomans. I mean, we've seen this same thing play out time and time again, with a crisis in the Balkans precipitated by European anger at the treatment of Christians leading the great powers to demand reforms meant to help Balkan Christians. The Ottomans knew better than anyone where all this was headed. So on December 23rd, 1876, while the great powers were meeting just down the street, Midhat Pasha went ahead and promulgated the first Ottoman constitution. And this constitution was really the culmination of Midhat's Ottomanism, and it declared, quote, All the subjects of the empire are without distinction called Ottomans, no matter what religion they profess. And, quote, all the Ottomans enjoy individual liberty on condition of not attacking the liberty of other people. Individual liberty is absolutely inviolable. So this constitution can be viewed as sort of the culmination of the Tanzimat, as it is enshrining the belief in the equality of all Ottoman citizens, regardless of their ethnic heritage or religious affiliation. And Midhat and company would follow up on these promises in ways that previous Tanzimat reformers had not. As part of this constitution, an Ottoman parliament was established, and this parliament included a chamber of deputies whose members would be elected by a popular vote. 
Now, there is still a long way to go here, as the electorate was limited to males, so there goes half the population, who also had to meet certain financial requirements. So this is not democracy, but it is injecting a healthy dose of popular government into the Ottoman imperial system that had been ruled as a bureaucratic autocracy for centuries. And perhaps most importantly, non-Muslims were invited to participate in this Ottoman parliament, and its members would include Greeks, Bulgarians, Armenians, Jews, and so on. But while this new constitution was in many ways the culmination of liberal reform within the framework of Midhat Pasha's Ottomanism, there were a few very important clauses in the constitution that would signal that Abdul Hamid did not intend to have his powers limited in the fashion of a European-style constitutional monarch. Because the constitution went out of its way to establish that ultimate sovereignty lay with the sultan and did not derive from the people. So this was a document handed down from the sultan to his subjects, in which the sultan was allowing his subjects to participate in government. And then finally, the new constitution quite tellingly had as its very first article, quote, The Ottoman Empire forms an indivisible whole from which no part can ever be detached for any motive whatsoever. Within the context of the Constantinople conference that was being held down the street, it was pretty obvious what this was referring to. Midhat Pasha and Sultan Abdul Hamid knew that the great powers were discussing how to best go about partitioning Ottoman Europe. So what the promulgation of the constitution amidst the Congress amounted to was the Ottomans trying to get ahead of European demands so that they could announce reforms on their own terms. They knew that the Europeans would use the mistreatment of Ottoman Christians as an excuse to intervene and potentially annex large amounts of territory in the Balkans. So the Ottomans are basically saying, hey, look, we finally did it. A new constitution that ensures the civil liberties of Christian minorities and offers Christians a voice in government. Now you don't have to intervene anymore. Phew, glad we figured that out. And when the constitution was first announced, the Ottomans would fire a cannonade to mark the occasion. And they made sure that this cannonade was loud enough for the great power delegates to hear. The Ottomans then sent a representative down to the conference to bring news of the Constitution and to invite the Congress to disperse, being like, hey, you know that cannonade you just heard? Well, that announced the Ottoman Constitution, and um, that means you can all go home now, please. But this did not really work, and the great powers felt that this was too little too late, and they carried on with their business of carving up Ottoman Europe. But Mina Pasha and Sultan Abdul Hamid knew what they were doing here. Even though they thought it was worth a try, they didn't really expect the great powers to give in that easily. And really, the main reason for promulgating the constitution had to do with domestic politics. Because, as we said earlier, the past year had seen massive demonstrations in Constantinople protesting European meddling in Ottoman affairs amidst the debt crisis. Well, the Constantinople Conference was like the peak of European meddling, and the presence of these European delegates was creating a lot of anger and resentment amongst the residents of Constantinople. And now that this new liberal constitution had been announced, this resentment even extended to many Ottoman Christians and Jews, especially in Constantinople, as many Greeks, Bulgarians, Armenians, and Jews were getting excited about the prospect of participating in a popular government. And with this resentment of European meddling growing, the overwhelming response to the promulgation of the constitution was euphoria, as Ottomans of all stripes saw this as the dawning of a new day, and there was this brief moment of unity within the Ottoman Empire. But as is so often the case with these sorts of things, what was bringing people together was not just their new rights and expanded representation, though that was a part of it, but perhaps even more significant was widespread anger towards Russia, as it was obvious to everyone that the Russians were trying to use the Constantinople Conference to ensure the diplomatic isolation of the Ottomans so that Russia could freely conquer the Balkans without any great power interference. And indeed, this is exactly what the Russian diplomats were doing as they were following the lead of Count Ignatiev, who had always wanted to conquer the Balkans and had in fact made it a centerpiece of his career as a foreign ambassador. And during the course of the Constantinople Conference, 
Count Ignatieff had been putting on the charm offensive with the British delegate Lord Salisbury. And this charm offensive worked as Salisbury quickly began to veer away from the official British policy of neutrality under Prime Minister Disraeli, and his negotiations began to be much more in line with the radically anti-Ottoman William Gladstone. And so, the representatives of arguably the two most powerful nations involved, Ignatiev, the Russian Pan-Slav, and Salisbury, the Englishman now under Ignatiev's spell, began to drive the direction of the conference. So, on January 20th, 1877, after a month of deliberation, the conference announced its decisions. First, they decided that Bosnia-Herzegovina would be made into an autonomous province similar to Serbia and Romania. But a sub-agreement here was that Austria-Hungary would be given hegemony over Bosnia-Herzegovina, and the territory would only nominally be under Ottoman suzerainty. Second, the conference decided to split Bulgaria into two separate autonomous provinces, Eastern Bulgaria and Western Bulgaria, and these two provinces were to be occupied by an international gendarme police force meant to maintain order. And the assumption here was that Russia would assume a degree of influence over one or both of these Bulgarian provinces, with Ottoman control again only being a nominal suzerainty. So, this was the humiliating culmination to what had been a long, humiliating process. And with anti-Ottoman feelings swelling in the capital, the Ottomans could not accept these terms and still expect to retain any sort of legitimacy at home. And so, they did not accept the terms. And Midhat Pasha formally rejected the decisions of the conference just days after they were presented to him and the sultan. And with widespread anger at the heavy-handedness of the Russian diplomats surging through Constantinople, and with pan-Slavic anti-Ottoman patriotism gripping Moscow and St. Petersburg, the leaders of both empires knew that this would mean war. And so, on April 24, 1877, almost exactly one year after the Bulgarians had launched the April Uprising, Russia declared war on the Ottoman Empire. This Russian intervention had been what nearly all of the Balkan rebels, whether Serbian or Bulgarian, had always been aiming at. And next week we will see why, as the Russians will finally embark on their long-awaited conquest of European Turkey, and they will make it all the way to Constantinople. But what would ultimately happen once the Russians reach the gates of the old Byzantine capital, their hallowed Tsargrad, future capital of their long dream for greater Orthodox Slavic Empire, still remain to be seen. Because boy, let me tell you, the other great powers are going to have quite a few feelings about this gigantic Slavic Empire under Russian tutelage. And it's going to be a bit too much for the old Brits, as the spirit of the great game will rear its ugly head one last time, and British public opinion will go back to its tried-and-true anti-Russian paranoia. And so, the British and the Russians will once again use the territorial integrity of the Ottoman Empire as a proxy for their imperial rivalry. And ultimately, it will be this imperial scheming that will once again dictate the future course of Balkan liberation.